Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, the giver of every good gift, you sent your son to gather a people, your church. You put us on mission. You gather us around the word, mark us in our baptism, and feed us for the mission with holy food. As we gather this day, cause us to see, to know, to experience, to celebrate the wonder of this feast. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, amen. In just under three weeks, um, this place will become for my family what it has been for many of you and your families. It will be a place of a grand celebration. There will be a lovely woman standing over here and the man who thinks he deserves her standing over there. <laughs> my daughter and my future son-in-law. And this will be a place filled with people, with family, with dearest friends. And it will be the beginning of a full day, and the party will go on and on and on. And a banker friend of mine, uh, after I had uh, led he and his family through the rehearsal, the wedding rehearsal many, many years ago, uh, said to me, you know, Pastor, when I hear you ask that question, who gives this woman to be married to this man? Now, this is a banker now. He said, what I really hear is, so who's the ones getting stuck with the bill for all this? That's starting to make sense to me. <laughs> the parable that Jesus tells is about a great banquet. It's about a great celebration. It's one that everybody's been invited to, and, and he can't wait, and he sends his servants out, and he says, you know, you got to save the date. You know, you, you got to, uh, we'll, we'll tell you exactly when it's ready. And they all RSVP'd, and they said, We'll be there. We will be there for the great banquet. And the food is ready and everything is in place. And then the servants go out to give the final reminder, it's now. And everybody says, eh, got something else. Uh, one says, I, I just bought a field. I got to go look at it. Now, come on, really? Uh, real estate then is really no different than today. Yeah, don't buy real estate with going and looking at it. You walk through the house. You, you look at the field. It was an excuse. The same thing with oxen. They didn't get on the internet and say, oh, there's five yoke of oxen. That's fantastic. They went and looked at them already. Nope, can't come. Got to go see the oxen. Nope, can't come. And there's the caller of the feast with everything ready and the banquet hall is empty and you know that has special impact on, on me as a preacher today because I'm thinking we invited everybody and, and we're ready for the party but what if on that day the only ones who were standing here in this place were mom and dad of bride and mom and dad of groom and then we all drove over to the banquet hall and we tried to eat the food for more than 150. And it was just the six of us. That the caller of the feast was angry? I get that now. What? Are you kidding me? You said you'd be there. We plan on you. We want you there. But it wasn't an anger because of the finances involved. The caller of the feast in the parable is heartbroken because this isn't just an ordinary great banquet. Jesus is describing 
the invitation into the kingdom of God. And this banquet uh, is the great feast of heaven. And what's happened is for those for whom it's been prepared, it's seen to be just not that important anymore. Right before Jesus tells the parable, he makes this comment that seems kind of odd if you read it out of context. He says, if you're going to throw a party, and since we're getting ready to throw a party, I was reading that especially closely. He says, if you're going to throw a party, don't invite the people who can throw a party and invite you too. Invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Invite the folks who don't have the resources. Invite the folks who can't pay you back. Make it a really gracious, bold feast. And then he goes on to tell the parable. And when the guests who were invited and don't come, then he says, invite the folks who don't deserve to be there. Invite the folks who aren't a part of the first guest list. And really what Jesus is talking about, he's talking about the people of the promise all through the Old Testament, the children of Abraham, to whom the promise was made that they would inherit the kingdom of God. And Jesus comes as the door into the kingdom. Jesus comes as the entry place into life that will not end. And so many of those who held the promise didn't want to come to the feast. So finally he says, let the folks to whom the invitation wasn't given, let them come. Let the Gentiles, let the folks without Abraham's blood running in their veins, let them come. And it's all a parallel to coming into the kingdom of God. It's all a parable as to being invited into the great feast that we celebrate today. The mystery of what happens in bread and wine. And who gets invited today? Anyone who can pay back God? Anyone who can throw a feast and who is his equal? No. Those who get invited today and those who come, and, and, and even as the meal is offered, Pastor Beck as we, and I, as we take turns uh, delivering the meal to you, it's one beggar offering the food of life, the bread of life, to other beggars. None of us able to repay the honor, the gift, the value but we come with hands open and hearts open. We're in our final series on For the Life of the World, and we're talking about church. We're talking about the way that God forms his people. Last week we talked about uh, through the Lord's Prayer. We talked about gathering uh, through holy baptism. We talked about becoming the church. The church isn't a building. The church is a people. Today we talk about the fact that we gather to be church, and God sends us out. And when he gathers us in, he often feeds us with a Christ so that we can be animated for mission and ministry that happens in our homes, that happens in our neighborhoods, that happens wherever we are. The image of feast is all through the scriptures. I knew, I knew that the Bible was meant for Lutherans. It's all about eating. Are you in? <laughs> Did you hear the Old Testament reading? Did you hear the Old Testament reading? On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all the peoples, a banquet of aged wines. Hmm, Merlot? Hmm. 
the best of meats, the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all people, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all the faces. He'll remove all the disgrace from his people. The scene, the scene is the great banquet in the forever gathering of God's people. And it's not a place for teetotalers. There's going to be wine and meats, the best of meats. In fact, I hope that as I talk about it today, you start to drool and you get a rumbly and you're tumbly. And that's part of the reason why for communion today, we've, we've asked one of our members to bake a loaf. Because it's really kind of hard to, to capture and convey the feast imagery when we're giving you a compressed piece of unleavened bread that kind of tastes like styrofoam. It's almost like the, the church is doing everything it can to, to uh, counteract the image of feast. Here, have this little teeny porcel of tasteless bread. So today we have homemade unleavened bread. You'll taste the wheat. You'll taste the honey. A reminder that we are linked with all the faithful around the world, that we are linked with the angels and archangels and all the hosts of heaven in this victory feast. And this is a meal that we need, a meal that if you, if you listened extra careful, you caught it in that Isaiah 25 passage. We're eating the great banquet. But the Lord, did you notice what he eats? The Lord swallows up death. I don't think that tastes like finest wines and finest meats. The Lord eats, swallows death so that you and I have life, and life that will never end. And we will be united with those who go before us. And as we gather for communion, we remember the company of the saints, and that we are a part of that, and they are, and they are already in their rest. Oh, it's powerful, beautiful, true wisdom from God. We trusted in him. He is our salvation. Let us rejoice, that Isaiah passage ends. We trusted in him. He is our salvation. Let us rejoice. My pastor, when I was in confirmation, uh, said that he would love it if somebody came up for communion, and he says, I understand it when people come up for communion and they have kind of a heavy countenance, they're burdened. We're, we're coming to the Lord, bringing our sins, bringing our, our awareness uh, that we have not loved our neighbor as ourselves, bringing our awareness that we have not fully entrusted ourselves to God and to his care, that we have worry and anxiety and all these other. So we bring these things, but then at the meal, we exchange them. Jesus gives us himself, and he takes from us the things that we have confessed, the things that burden us, he takes them away as he gives us himself. And so my pastor, now sainted, uh, my pastor, Pastor Ron Zender, has uh, told me in my confirmation class, that wasn't last year, I can't wait for the day when somebody comes up for communion and when they leave, they do a backflip or a cartwheel because they know what just happened in this meal. Life was renewed, sin was taken away, and hope was restored. And we leave the table, not with dour faces, but we leave the table rejoicing, for God is true to his promises. And then, and then in our second reading, 
1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul is writing about temptation. What does temptation have to do with celebrating the Lord's Supper? He writes there and he says, no, one, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. And with every temptation, God will provide a way out of it. Some translations read, a way of escape. And that, that he won't let us be tempted in a way that we can't withstand. And then he goes right into talking about Holy Communion. Isn't the cup that we drink our participation in the blood of Christ? Isn't the bread that we eat a participation in the body of Christ? And this, and this one loaf reminds us that we are one in Christ. This one loaf for communion today reminds us that we are one body united in the Christ. And we share that unity with those that have gone before us. We share that unity with the church around the world. So symbolically today we take from one loaf to remind us that we are united in and under Christ. What do we receive when we receive this bread and this wine? What are the gifts that are received? The Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. The one who knows Abba, the Heavenly Father's love, better than anyone else, gives himself so that we might know the grand love of God and so that we might be energized and transformed so that the posture of our life might look like that of the Christ. Not a place of lording over, but a place of serving, of supporting. A place that as we eat this food, we too begin to carry on and continue the mission of Christ for the life of the world. It's no mistake that this meal, as we gather together as God's people, comes at the end of our service. One last time we gather together around the altar under Christ. Christ comes to be in us in this bread and wine, his body and blood, so that we might be renewed and refilled, sins forgiven, faith strengthened, and energized and sent out. It's the end of the service because the sending is happening. The gathering takes place so that we can be sent out on the mission, so that we can bring the compassionate, sacrificial love of the Christ wherever we go. And today, as we give honor to moms, think for a moment. Who is one of the most sacrificial and giving people you know? Chances are It was your mom. Maybe you saw it in an aunt. Maybe you saw it in your grandma. And he said, go to the streets. 
Go to the highways. Go into the country lanes. Go everywhere. Go quickly. Because my house must be full. Imagine my disappointment if only the six of us were there at the reception. Imagine how the Father, the Father of us all, must feel if there is an empty banquet hall and some are missing who could be a part of this forever feast. Father in heaven, we thank you for this meal. We thank you that it binds us together, links us as brothers and sisters in Christ, that we receive the very Christ. And Father, we want in this place to be on mission. We want your house, your forever house and forever banquet to be full. May our days and our deeds help that to become real for this generation and the next generation, for coworker and neighbor, for others like us who are not worthy but come as beggars to the feast. And all God's people said,